All right. So I know that there's some Apple fans in the group, and I know that there's some non-Apple fans in the group, but uh, we're going to play a little game. It's not a huge prize, but it's a nice little iPod Nano. Not sure if anybody has one of these, but if you're an Apple fan, it might make a nice collection to uh, the iPad, iPhone, iMac, everything else that we have. I personally have most of the Mac products, but I don't have this, so I'm jealous to be giving it away. We're going to play a little game called Wait, Wait, Don't Blame Me, as David introduced earlier. Uh, for people in the U.S., NPR is National Public Radio, and it's a radio talk show that plays a game called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Our spin on it, Wait, Wait, Don't Blame Me, we're going to present some scenarios where there's a real-life situation that actually happened, where virtualization was being blamed for something, and a made-up story. I'm going to give you two different scenarios, and it's up to you to decide which one is the true story. You have your uh, pieces of paper and markers in front of you. For our online community, how are we doing with the stream? I, are we up right now? Yeah. I've been following Tech Field Day, you know, long before we presented last year and almost every event afterwards. And uh, I know the online community always says, the free stuff is always for the delegates. How do I get to go? Well, this time, uh, for the online community, you get to play along. So there are prizes for people out there watching right now. I'll talk to the camera. Log on to uh, zangati.com slash VFD2. It's a slightly different version than what I'll be presenting, but uh, go ahead, play the game, fill out the form. Hopefully you'll get to win one of the t-shirts, which uh, goes along with our Blame Wars theme. Or uh, we have some smaller prizes. Grand prize a t-shirt. Go ahead, play. And uh, for the delegate in the room that is still standing at the end, the grand prize is the iPad Nano. iPad? iPod. Yeah. iPod. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, iPad Nano. <laughs> Shoot, I just, I, I just interrupt. Uh, I just messed up the Apple announcement. All right. So I actually had three scenarios. I'm only going to do two because Nathaniel actually already talked about one, and we're running a little bit of time. We're going to do futures of the product, so I want to make sure we have enough time to do that. Scenario A. OK. It's 2 PM. I better get a Red Bull, sighed Sam, the sysadmin. Every day at 2 PM, Sam had problems with his infrastructure. He studied for and passed the VCP 3, 4, 5, and 6 exams. He networked with his peers at his local VMUG. He got along well with all the other IT guys and gals at his company. He did everything right. But every day at 2 p.m. for the last week, his iPhone started ringing and beeping. His inbox blew up, and someone was standing over his shoulder in his cubicle. It's like I watched the clock and knew when to put on my battle helmet, he half joked. It wasn't until he deployed Zangati and made a recording between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. did he realize what was going on. Storage backups were happening at 2 p.m. instead of 2 a.m. And the worst part about that was that the storage admin was always the loudest when blaming virtualization after the afternoon chaos. Sam was able to make a Zangati recording showing all of the interactions and utilization of the data stores and shared that recording with his team. Victory was seeing the face of the storage admin when she saw the recording, and V-beers were on Sam that night. So that's scenario A. True or false? Hold on. Here's scenario B. We hit a wall, exclaimed Vito, the CTO of a 4,500 employee nonprofit company. We virtualized the easy things first, and when we reached 60% virtual, we were stuck. As with most companies trying to convince line of business owners and applica application managers to go virtual isn't an easy game to play. They need assurance that their multi-tier applications will perform just as well in a virtual environment as it does 
in their physical one. And if anything goes wrong, the blame wars begin and heads roll. Realizing his current management tools didn't provide the necessary information to convince his internal customers to go virtual with their applications, this CTO headed to his local VMUG to talk to vendors, and it's where he found Zangati. After deploying Zangati, Vito went from 60% to 98% virtualized in just a three-month period. Zangati was the only one that showed the second-by-second -second details I needed to push virtualization further within my company. There's the two stories. So we have to pick the one that we think is true. There's one true one in there. The other one had a slight flaw. Maybe you picked up on it or maybe you didn't. So A or B. Write down on your pieces of paper so there's no changing your mind afterwards. <laughs> now both of these are things that Zengai can handle and easily would solve, but only one of them is a true story. No cheating. <laughs> Who are all the B's? And who are all the A's? Which one is true? Which one is true? B is the true story. Whoa. Excellent. Moving on to the next one, we have a guest. Who knows the virtual guy on Twitter? Jason Morris. He's a, a Zangati fan. He has a, I, I didn't ask for this, but he has a short little message. It's a very short one in the, in the beginning, but he's going to present the next two scenarios. So let me get these speakers plugged in. Good My name is Jason Morris. I'm an IT manager for National Food Brokers located in Canada, running 100% virtualized on VMware View and ESXi across all five of our branches. I wanted to quickly congratulate all the delegates on your selection who participate in the 2012 Tech Field Day. Zangati is an instrumental and vital piece of software for our environment. It is imperative that I'm able to quickly assess the health of my environment in order to be able to catch any potential problems before they occur. <coughs> Zangati has asked me to put together a couple of scenarios, one of which is real, the other made up. It is up to you then to decide which one is real and which one is made up. So let's get started. Scenario 1. After completing our initial proof of concept on VMware View, we began to start our rollout to our users. As we gradually grew our system and brought all users onto View, users started to complain about overall performance and intermittent freezing of sessions on our new system. The situation was quickly escalated to the executive level by departmental managers, resulting in a lot of pressure to quickly identify the issue. Through some initial investigations and some in-depth discussions with VMware and other industry professionals, we could not identify the problem. After a frustrating period of working with various vendors and other IT professionals, we discovered Zangati and a suite of metrics specifically designed for VMware people. We quickly installed Zangati, turned it up in our production environment, so that we could start to further evaluate and understand what was happening behind the scenes. It was quickly discovered that our CPU ready state was around 250 milliseconds consistent and spiking to around 1,000 milliseconds during peak times. We were able to quickly rectify the issue by reducing the amount of vCPUs assigned to our Windows XP session, and our system returned to 13 milliseconds consistent and peaks of around 50 milliseconds, and complaints about our view system all but went away, and our users are far more productive than previous. Scenario 2. Almost two years ago, we were confident that there was a problem with our SAN. We just couldn't prove it. We suspected and experienced latency issues, that, but just did not have the right data or reports to pinpoint where the problems lied. After installing Zengadi, we could correlate latency and IOPS metrics and quickly isolated the problem. It turned out that there was a bug on how vSphere handled iSCSI metrics and gave us false information. It turns out that virtualization was actually to blame, not storage. But the best part of Zangadi is that it truly helped us pinpoint where the problem lies and who should be responsible for taking care of it. Virtualization isn't perfect. We just don't want to be immediately blamed for every problem. That's all for me. I hope you guys have a great tech field day. I look forward to chatting with you guys on Twitter. And uh, all the best. Take care. All right. Two different scenarios from Jason Morris. He said one or two A, B, Everybody write down your answers. So the A's going to be 
We're gonna let him play again. All right. Who's got all the A's? Or ones? Who's got the B's? It's the first one. It's A. A real world problem we helped Jason solve. We contacted VMware, the industry experts, and didn't think to check for any time. Seriously. This is, I mean, true fact. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so his his words. Yeah. So should we? I mean, uh, we will. Should we explain uh, explain why, why each scenario was wrong, and then. Uh, Sure. The, the first one um, I had mentioned uh, in the false scenario that he had passed his VCP6 exam, which uh, does uh, not exist uh, yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question that lasts for many years to come. Yeah. <laughs> and in uh, Jason's second scenario, um, Zangati, two years ago when he said that he looked at it, did not report on IOPS. That's a more recent feature that we incorporated. Yeah. It's very it subtle. Those IOPS from Virtual Center and ESX anyway, so if there was a fault <laughs> in it, it yeah. would just get the same fault information in the Garthi, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would. <coughs> right. So a little fun. So who got two out of two? We got one, two, three, four. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Everyone's being honest? <laughs> um, I'm going to skip the third one in essence of time. All right, out of the four of you, lightning round. This is for the iPod <coughs> Nano. 83. Break down your answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong, by the way, so. <laughs> okay, I'll give you another shot. <laughs> Everybody got their answer out of the four? Take a guess. Uh, I almost said you said 79. You know the first two numbers, at least. So Empire Strikes Back. One more. Who is the fourth one? Are you? Did you get a second one? I, I truly agree. All right. All right. You're all still in the running. It was 1980. 1980. I was even born then. I thought it was. Oh, come on. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for people not in the U.S., but it's a U.S. geography question. Hopefully, the other three will get it wrong, and you'll still be in the running, too. So I just have to pick a random state. The, there you go. Give a two percent chance. So which U.S. state is the home of the annual and bacon apocalypse now event? <laughs> One, two. Where's the jeopardy? You got fifty-two or is it fifty-three? Fifty-two states. Fifty-two states. We, we don't count Canada and Puerto Rico. Waiting on Wayne. <laughs> You're all still in the running. <laughs> it was not Texas, Minnesota, or New Jersey. It's Iowa. That makes sense. I have nothing else to do there. <laughs> now, this was actually talked about earlier today. In what unit of time is Zangati's ab object handling time? Isn't that repetitive? Okay, yes. <laughs> repetitive, but not necessarily redundant. I'm not really sure I get the question, but... <laughs> There's only about 15 choices, if you're wondering. What is that? Milliseconds? I don't know. Milliseconds? Seconds? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. One over. No, I may have misinterpreted the question. I was thinking out of handling time on the GUI, not what it's actually recording. It's the object handling, so you're all still in the running. Microseconds, which, Jagan, what is a microsecond? One, one, <laughs> one, one million? All right, we will get to a winner, I promise. We're going to dwindle it down maybe here. Which Star Wars character said, that's no moon, that's a space station? I don't know, man. No, I don't. Well, I'm a puppy. Yeah. Do I hear We have a winner. Obi Wan Kenobi. Thank you. Woohoo! So, there was one last question on here that was going to be the deciding factor. How many times has the free version of Zangati software been downloaded? Over 9,000. Over, <laughs> over 9,000. 
600,000. One. What? <laughs> Well, I've downloaded the other uh, uh, times myself. <laughs> <laughs> if we were still in the running. Is this price is right? We are at 7,000. Right at 7,000. Right 7, oh. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. 6,900 well, 6, and some change. We'll, we'll be at uh, 7,000 very soon. Yeah, and, uh, I, and, it, and it's worth noting again, since we are talking about the downloads with this audience here, a couple things for the, for the online audience. You know, anybody who goes to the website can download our free tool, right? Um, which is which covers one ESX, no problem. Uh, we can also anybody can do a, a trial of the, the production software, which covers multiple hosts, multiple um, uh, multiple desktops, if you will. And the other thing is, if anybody in this room specifically, uh, you know, this community is interested in getting a, an NFR license because you want to deploy this in your lab. You know, we are very happy to set that up. So, you know, let, let's uh, communicate about this. So okay. just let me know or give me a DM or something like that. I'll make sure it happens. And of course, nobody's going home losers. As a good game show host, there are parting gifts for everybody. Uh, we have Blame Wars t-shirts for everybody. Like, so <laughs> T-shirts for you! T-shirts for you! So uh, we have sizes, t-shirts with uh, various sizes over there. Make sure you grab one of those. Thanks for playing. Yeah, we still have... We have, uh, John, you're going to come up with me too. So I, I think we will, we're kind of at the verge of running over a little bit. Um, so um, at least for the delegates, obviously, you know, in, in the next 10 minutes, we're not necessarily going to cover everything. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've already, how I was planning to have the pretext of this conversation was, you know, the reason that we get an august body like this together is to have a dialogue, right? And so it already seems like we've had some active dialogue from you guys as you've been hands-on with the product about areas that we can improve, right? So if I were to summarize some of the things that I already heard, um, you know, give me more feeds, right? So one of the things that uh, seems to be resonating with you folks is the capabilities of the system to, with the feeds that we have, provide, you know, high value, high resolution, high usability. Um, you know, I think Ed in particular was asking a lot of questions sort of related to the cloud. Um, and, and tie in with cloud frameworks and, you know, duly noted. So I you know, wanted to say, you know, even before we get into sharing with you some of the things that we're doing, we won't necessarily be super specific in every one of the, the categories because we do have competitors and we don't necessarily want to flash all of our roadmap to everybody and we're doing it out there on the internet. But, you know, hopefully we've, we've kind of established a couple things. One is, you know, as a virtualization management solution, um, certainly, our, our entry into this market was from the performance sector, right? Um, but as we all know, you know, virtualization management, even cloud management, has many other vectors that, that need to be taken care of. Um, things that we've done, again, over time, as we look at things, we have continued to add various feeds into the infrastructure. So uh, most recently, literally less than a month ago, we collaborated directly with Citrix on um, getting their HTX protocol into our system. So we first collaborated with VMware and Teradici to enable the function that Nathaniel showed you today. Uh, we you know, collaborated with those guys, uh, you know, Citrix as well, because we believe on the VDI side, there is no 800 pound gorilla. I mean, many of you guys coming from the server virtualization side, VMware is, is clearly the de facto standard. On the VDI side, we run across customers that run a gamut in that regard. But, Hopefully we've established for you that foundationally, <clears throat> as we look forward with the Zangade solution, that uh, we have a lot of things in play, not only for server and desktop virtualization, but a capability to ultimately scale the solution to the requirements of, you know, whether it's the private cloud or the public cloud, but uh, the point is that as you scale this up, uh, you, you increase the capacity of the environment that you're looking at. This is something that we're very cognizant of moving forward. So I just wanted to give you that sort of take it back to where we are architecturally. Um, and again, you know, although we look at things originally from the performance domain as we go forward and talk about a few things at a high level, you can see us expanding our intellectual property uh, in, in other realms. So just that's kind of a uh, starting point. So there are kind of three topics that, that I'll, I'll talk about uh, with, with Jagan and collaboration. Um, it's worth noting uh, in terms of how Jagan and I, so again, uh, Nathaniel and I represent product management from the company. Jagan, uh, our CTO founder, he also carries the title of VP of engineering 
we tend to work off of two major release cycles a year and, and in that process also come up with uh, quite a number of updates and I think you know Dwayne and uh, Roger can certainly attest to you know, us keeping to a very brisk schedule of releases with a lot of new functionality in them. But you know, kind of three areas. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing on the VDI uh, realm, again in collaboration with VMware and Citrix. Uh, talk about, um, you know, heaven forbid, because in this audience, I've uh, kind of read everybody's profile. A lot of folks here are very heavy into VMware, but it's worth noting. You know, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, on the server virtualization realm, uh, our belief that you actually have to be able to sort heter heterogeneous environments, other hypervisors that are out there aside from VMware. I have to say it. And we'll also talk about some of the things that we're doing to expand what we're doing uh, into the capacity domains as well. Because frankly speaking, as a virtualization admin, you know, there are problems that run into performance and capacity. And you know, the, the delta between one versus the other is not so finite in your world. So those are, those are the things that we'll talk about. Um, on, the, on the VDI side, as I said earlier, you know, some of the proof points that you know, differentiate us on the VDI side is our ability to uh, collaborate directly with both VMware and Citrix. Uh, the proof points start with the, the VDI session protocols, what we've been able to do there. Uh, the next thing that we're doing that uh, will be music to the ears of our VDI customers is ultimately they think about things in terms of end user and uh, end users, and I know Chris was sort of talking about that end user experience is key. Um, you know, in environments where where you have link clones, non-persistent desktops, whatever you want to call it, but these these users log in. You know, we have some customers that have students who move from classroom to classroom, and, and every time they do that, they get a new virtual machine. So in the in the system today, uh, we tend to track things on the on the virtual machine, and then you have to go to something like View Manager or Desktop Director, which is the Citrix equivalent, to effectively do that translation. And the interesting thing is, you know, you would think that that information is actually promulgated out into the infrastructure somewhere, but it's kind of heavily kept close to the vest by both VMware and Citrix in terms of you more or less have to interact with their connection brokers to get those kinds of insights. So as we move forward uh, in the release that, you know, again, we'll more formally brief you all in, in Q2 about, uh, the ability to track um, the end user as effectively uh, the, the, the primary object will become very valuable for our customers. Because think about the model here. One of the things that we will do is we will profile the end user behavior um, that way directly, not just the VMs, which again, you know, different users can log into different VMs. So that capability, as well as if you think about it from a service desk standpoint, the service desk person who's using a Zangati as an example will be able to just search on the end user in our search tab, pull them up and get a, get a live view of that user's activity and be able to drill all the way down into the individual session. So, this is one of the things that uh, I know some of our customers in particular that we've um, solicited feedback on our roadmap are, are very excited about. Um, and it's also worth noting in the same fashion, um, as you play with, with the dashboard, uh, that same kind of dynamic function of things coming and going in a VDI sense, uh, the dashboard, and I think this is a little bit of, uh, to, to what Ed was saying as well, you'll be able to program rule sets to effectively fill the different columns in the dashboard more automatically. Right now it is, admittedly a process, I have to kind of say these are things that I want to have, but you'll be able to actually define rule sets of classes of things that I want to populate each of the columns in the dashboard. And that's something that we're also doing uh, the first half of this year. So um, again, you know, specifically, um, I think there might have been some you know, preconceived notions coming in that you know, Zangati's orientation is, is on the VDI side. Um, you know, I'm starting with this um, you know, function, but uh, you know, wh why I'm doing that is because in this case, it, it sort of sets up a conversation that ultimately you have to play with the key vendors in each sector, right? And if you look at VDI, uh, both those vendors have fairly sizable market share. So that's something you'll see as we move forward is getting more and more feedback of how to work with both companies. Uh, again, I know there might be preferences in the room, uh, I don't think I heard Zen Desktop from anywhere. Mike, I think yours is the only profile where you kind of talk about Citrix is something that you also have an orientation in. But out there in our, our user community, we see as many Zen Desktop users as VMware View users. When you start to talk about a um, desktop profile, mm -hmm. what are you talking about profiling, the metrics you can get, or are you talking about the actual actions with the side of the desktop? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. Uh, you know, 
semantics become very interesting because there is actually a concept of a desktop profile. Um, yes. Uh, here we're really talking about our performance profiles, the, the metrics that we learn uh, on a per object basis about the performance activity of that, that desktop. How useful is that when, say, hey, this guy is always badly performing, but gee, all he does today is produce PDS day minute after minute after minute, CPU intensive, it's graphically intensive, mm -hmm. you know, or he manipulates a huge Excel spreadsheet. You know, wouldn't it be better to redesign the application so it's not that big, mm -hmm. it's in pieces, but that won't have a huge impact on networking or anything like that, or may not, it could all be local. So all you're telling me is that, yeah, he uses CPU all the day, all day long, but we know that. Mm -hmm. If I don't know the app he's using, I can't help him fix the problem ever. Well, but you can see into the processes that he's driving through the WMI capabilities that we have. So, you so you're recording that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So you are doing what's inside the program? We are doing what's inside the guest correlated to our recordings. Okay. The, Thank you. The issue is if that user moves around. You don't, you could be on desktop 45 one day, the next he's on 62, yeah. and you'll never track it because you'll never know what's happening. Yep. So you're not just doing performance metrics, you're actually doing what he's doing. We're doing what he's doing, and, and that comes up all the time. Uh, you know, that's why we added that functionality. I mean, folks like Dwayne and Roger were kind of clamoring for it because we need to see inside the guest, you know, to support that end user because he can, he can be doing crazy things. And same thing happens on the server side, to be entirely blunt. We have so many conversations with virtualization admins that are supporting, you know, horrifically coded um, applications. And unless they can actually present back the recordings of what's happening on the server side, um, on the Windows side as an example, uh, they, can't, they can't put that argument forward clearly. And a recording makes things crystal clear in that regard. Um, similarly, again, you know, believing uh, as a third party um, management solution that you know, kind of has a technology leadership role, we see on the server side, I know there were, were uh, you know, kind of questions about kind of integrations on the, on the cloud framework side. Uh, one of the things that we're being pushed very heavily on is that many of our customers are you know, moving into domains where they are starting to tier um, their hypervisor strategy, right? So, I mean, we all know, and you know, VMware still has its dominant market share, but the reality is that since uh, many of us have entered into this market, you guys, you know, before Sangati, uh, VMware's market share has, you know, changed significantly over time. So on, during the, the back half of the year, you'll see us start to integrate um, specifically with the other uh, leading hypervisors, Hyper-V as an example, or uh, Zen Server. I mean, we are finding Many of the Citrix and desktop customers are driving to Zen Server on the back end. There are very, very obvious financial reasons for so, doing so. Zen Server effectively comes for free when you do Zen Desktop. Um, you sound almost like you're apologizing to us for it. What's that? You almost sound like you're apologizing for supporting something other than VMware. It's this is virtualization building. Well, <laughs> well, it's interesting. Actually, if Stephen Fox gets out there, you know, last time I briefed him, we had a whole conversation about, you know, the, the move towards supporting something aside yeah. from v, VMware. And the reality is that our customers, you know, a couple things to think about it, are actually diversifying, diversifying their strategies. And the other thing is, um, you know, as a third party management solution that isn't tethered to any vendor, and hopefully you've got that sense, um, ultimately we believe that part of our differentiation will be doing touch point integrations with each one of the, the leading vendors. And it's worth noting, you know, it's probably more of an offline conversation at the Winchester Mystery House. But Jaga can share with you that each hypervisor, as we all know, has its own set of APIs or lack thereof. Uh, they have different frameworks um, in which that uh, information can be gathered, uh, some more optimal than others. And so doing that effort is actually you know, pretty significant work, not only for Zangati, but anybody who chooses to go down that path. And it is one that we believe in, in investing heavily in. Um, so that's just you know another major thing to keep in mind that uh, is in is in our mind because our customers are driving us. To it's about future proofing your product from potential changes in that market share uh, amongst the virtualization platform vendors. I've I've come across customers who had Zen Desktop running on top of ESX and they've moved completely over their desktop stuff over to Zen Server. Yeah. Um, but that arose because historically they'd had Citrix as a kind of the Zen app or presentation server, and it just became politically easier to have them corralled in their own little area 
you know, and for the VMware guys to say, well, don't call us if you have a problem. So it does kind of does happen. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we, you know, Al and I were, were visited by one of the, you know, literally largest, you know, VMware customers in the world. I can't exactly say who, but they have 30,000 hosts. So not VMs, 30,000 hosts. And, you know, their strategy is effectively to have a diversified strategy uh, because they, they need to have it. And, uh, you know, so, so what size they have to be to protect themselves from, they will be diversified on the hardware platform as well. Yeah. Yeah, on the hardware Which platform, and, and you know, for, for those of us who come originally from the networking space, we're used to making sure there's at least some diversification in the network. Is that an oil and gas company? <laughs> uh, the one I mentioned? Yeah. Uh, no. Pharmaceutical. Uh, financial services. Oh, okay. yeah. but we, so, but, well, but the fact is we hear it very common. Now we're talking financial services, we're talking banking, we're talking PCI, we're talking GBLA, we're talking SOX, we're talking like all sorts of compliance requirements. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that client compliance requirements say nobody should be able to see certain chunks of data. So now you're going to be putting in profile and allows me to use WMI to see chunks of data, mm -hmm. including applications that are being run. How can I prevent you guys from seeing any of that? That's actually got to be part of your solution because I can see this being your profiling mm -hmm. being a security nightmare. It's actually been quite the opposite. I mean, at this point, our customer base does include those big financials. It also includes spooky three-letter agencies that don't exist with people in black hats, right? <laughs> and for all of those people, the big significant thing is that we keep the information about the data, but we don't keep the data itself. Uh, Even that information about the data is about is information. That well, you know, as somebody about. who used to to you know work inside a secure facility for the Air Force, um, you know, there's always the people that have to know and are cleared to know, and those are the people that use our tool, frankly. Yes, I mean, you I know, agree. And so, in those environments where that's the concern, the use of our tool is also portioned out in the same way. Okay. So we've got people that use our tool only on red networks. Um, you know, they're not used on the black side, they're used on the, on the red side by people, you know, that are clear to see that information and obviously those systems are not available to other people in the way that the military does that anyways. They put a dude with an M16 outside the door and say, the tool's inside, come get it if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> the military's real good about security that way. They don't mess around with firewalls so much as a dude with a gun. No. <laughs> let's, let's, take, let's take this a step. It's not the military, it's not the, it's not the super right. now. It's not the people that have guns, but I still have different levels of classification. And in a lot of businesses where there's different levels of classification, the admins don't have the classification. Right. But they're the ones running the tools. So now you have run into a problem where you're giving insight to people that should definitely not be able to see it. When you pull the WMI, are you impersonating the the data user or no. Or service account? Uh, no, there's usually a service account. I mean, the requirement for WMI is that you have some account that maps to local administrator on the machine. That's not our rule, that's Microsoft's, right? Right. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's, if you impersonate, you can control who can dig down. Exactly. Right. And, you know, and I will tell you, there's organizations that do not use that capability of our tool. Yeah, and there is. Yeah, but the, you're all or nothing. No, there's. If you you're actually. under the service account. No, but you can you could actually log into specific V. I mean, you could set up a model where specific VMs are are, are viewed or, or not viewed. Or I mean, not viewed. So I mean, there's a global model or a very specific model is what we have today. No, I think the other thing the other thing. Same credentials each time, right? Well, you can actually specify credentials on a per object basis right. if you want to. Well, not so, only that, so now when you go to the cloud, I have to be able to say, yep, that tenant can view data. That tenant can't view the data because they ain't got it. Can see everything. Yes. So you guys got to build that in from the very beginning. Well, the ROV concept is is really yeah, it's probably worth reiterating. It's probably worth reiterating. The ROV concept is basically saying you only get to view per object data, but your point is well taken. I think part of our growth in terms of this kind of layering of access, access broadly access control for security, for compliance, for all kinds of reasons, I think we're going to learn as we hit those kinds of customers. So we do have ROV as something that people want to give to an ESX owner 
or a, a desktop owner, and they don't want any ROV is a remote object viewer. Oh, I think okay. he showed. So that's the idea of a very focused dashboard that only an individual gets to see, right. as opposed to seeing a whole picture. So this this concept of segregation really speaks to just present them the information they need to see and not everything, right? And I think we just have to build on that as we as we learn more about about the markets uh, we penetrate. Yeah, and it's it's worth noting just kind of taking a step back, if you look at our heritage, um, you know, Zangati originally coming from the networking space um, came out of the service provider market. So some, many of these concepts that are here actually even predate virtualization. So this idea of an end user recording, imagine yourselves having a problem with BT or Comcast or whoever, whoever being able to press that record button, having us see what was wrong with your, your, uh, your DSL connection, your, your cable connection at the time of a problem. The idea of the remote object viewer was actually created for the service providers to enable enterprises who were getting internet services to actually have real-time SLA information uh, about their broadband connection. So as you can see moving forward, as we move more into, you know, whether it's a, you know, an enterprise with a shared services model, IT as a service model where they're trying to parse out their private cloud to different business units or app owners, you could see us evolving that ROV concept in a number of dimensions, and this is certainly what we're planning on doing. Yeah, more logical groupings. I mean, I've you know I've heard that concept loud and clear, and you know, very interested to get some feedback on how we can go about doing that. It'd be really nice if you had a less busy dashboard. Just give you an uh, instantaneous view, to say something's good or bad, and then let me drill down from there to see all the moving graphs. Well, it's it's interesting that you say that. Uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, our Q2 release, we have uh, uh, even further streamlined you know, iteration of some of the dashboards that we have right. coming out. And have you considered perhaps bringing some of that information into Virtual Center directly as a plugin? Well, well, we certainly, a couple of things related to how we integrate with vCenter. The first is that you can certainly launch the Zongati system for vCenter. If you go to the management tab, we are a vCenter plugin. Um, you can launch from there. The other thing that's, that... Does that just launch the bigger applications? Yes. Uh, so what you're potentially alluding to is the idea of maybe down at a VM level... It's just kind of related to what Edward just said, which is I need something that's in the management tool. I spend most of my time, and it needs to be very, very simple, yep. you know, that I can just see it and react to it straight away. So I mean, almost... I need it. I mean, if I'm in a, in a cloud, whether it's cloud stack, vCloud, pick your favorite cloud, mm -hmm. I need it so that I can see it without having to worry about having a portal or having a whatever because the cloud provider may not do it. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to see the performance of my environment as not only that, but it's not just what I can see, but the interactions below to say, hey, that whole underlying layer could be red for all I know. And that could be the cause of it. And I need to be able to say, hey, service provider, Go look at this. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to, because the service provider is going to be looking at thousands upon thousands of objects and right. maybe thousands upon thousands of tenants. I need to be also be part of that as a tenant to say, hey, it doesn't look like it's in my area, but it could be in yours. Can you help me here? And then they can go and log in and drill down even further where I can't see it. Yeah, and, 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 we, and we, we couldn't agree with you more, again, coming back to, you know, the reason I brought up our heritage is, you know, when you start talking about service providers, they ultimately morph into these things called cloud providers. And the ability to see what's happening in real time, that's where that ROV concept starts and I think enhances because as you get into that, you have to trust but also verify that your performance is what you expect of it. And I think we have a great framework live and continuously to give you those insights. We certainly need to make some enhancements around that. Uh, I think the other interesting dialogue we're having with customers in that regard is what is a performance SLA for the cloud, right? Because it is no longer a availability conversation. It is a you know, performance conversation in many ways and it's not 95th percentile on a, on a network pipe, right? It's, it's a combination of those interactions. And also, if I bought 100% availability and 100% performance, and I spent the millions of dollars to get that, and I'm not getting it, I need a way to improve that one way or the other. Yep. And if I had bought 80% and I see that I'm sitting at 85%, you know, I gotta live with that, I'm happy. I may not be happy, but I gotta live with it, because yep. that's what I bought, that's my SLA. 
Right. So having a way to see what that SLA is, to be on a map, everything I see back down to that would be very, very valuable. Oh, that's a good point. All right. So uh, I think that's going to be it for Thursday today at Virtualization Field Day. I want to thank Zengadi for all their patients, their outstanding presentation, the bacon, the ice cream, uh, and for presenting an outstanding product. Thank you guys very much. Yes. For our viewers at home, uh, we're going to be continuing tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, with Pure Storage. We'll be at their offices with their ultra-fast internet connection. So, uh, <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, until then, have a great night. Tune in tomorrow, and thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, thanks again, guys. I really appreciate your patience. And, uh, and as well. Uh,